Good morning. I'm actually really impressed that so many people woke up to learn. So, uh, I have nothing to disclose. And what I do want to share, though, is originally uh, Richard Troiano was to be here. He's at, and he's at the National Cancer Institute and speak to physical activity. When he was unable to come, I became the substitute. And so I will share some of the things that he was going to present with regard to physical activity. And then I will transition into uh, my areas dealing with how we are approaching the improvement of dietary assessment. So with regard to physical activity, it will highlight how the accelerometer has helped us with disentangling some of the issues of discovering the benefits of physical activity. And then with regard to um, dietary assessment, I'll go through temporal dietary patterns, contextual information to enhance dietary assessment, and then other finish with relevant methodological issues that um, hopefully will give you some insight as to what might be coming up in the future as well as what is here now. So this is, um, in this uh, table, the data comes from a paper showing a stronger relationship with devices measured with a, on a variety of physical activity related health outcomes. So this is NHANES data and there are measures based on self-reported and accel accelerometer based activity. And the objectively measured physical activity, you can see all the relationships were stronger with regard to these biomarkers of health. And after adjusting for confounders, these even became stronger. However, there still were some relationship with the self-reported, and then also they weren't as strong with regard to significance, but they were there. And so taken together, these findings suggest that self-reported and objectively measured physical activity may capture distinct aspects of physical activity that are associated with biomarkers of health although objectively measured physical activity demonstrates significantly stronger associations. So the takeaway from this particular study, which was done actually done at the bottom, adi adi enza, the, the takeaway is self-reported is gives you better measures of physical activity associated with biomarkers of health. And those relationships are stronger. But both self-reported and objective methods are useful with regard to examining physical activity, behavior, and health outcomes. Now, the next question was, do activity bouts matter? So does the fractionalization of daily physical activities, that sporadic bouts versus bouts, or sporadic versus bouts, does that impact the association with cardiometabolic risk factors? And again, this was done with um, Anne Haynes. And the cardio, as you can see, the, there was a cardiometabolic risk score, and that was comprised of waist circumference, non-high density, lipoprotein, cholesterol, c protein, and systolic blood pressure. As illustrated in this figure, an equivalent number of minutes of sporadic, moderate to vigorous physical activity and bouts of moderate to vigorous activity had a comparable influence on the relative odds of a high cardiometabolic risk score. This was the this was the true this was true irrespective of the five minute or the ten minute bout threshold. So in conclusion here, the takeaway is moderate to vigorous physical activity is related to cardiometabolic risk factors of children and youth. And that is comparable whether the doses are sporadic or bouts. 
So the next area had to do with benefits that accrue if sedentary time is replaced by light activity. And this was also a concept that came up in the slides from Dr. Gill, Professor Gill. So accelerator, accelerometer measured dose response for physical activity and sedentary time and mortality. And this now is using end pains, but it's the mortality follow-up study. So it, this is, a, this is um, showing risk levels. And so what you can see at the top, overall, replacing one hour of sedentary time with one hour of light intensity activity was associated with an 18% lower mortality. And replacement of that one hour of moderate to vigorous intensity activity was associated with a 42% lower risk of mortality. Now that was among the whole sample. Among the low active adults, replacing one hour of sedentary time with physical activity was associated with a 20% reduction and replacing that with moderate to vigorous was a 63% lower risk. And the real takeaway with this is whereas with health promotion efforts, we have mostly focused on moderate to vigorous activity. But what we saw was increasing life intensity and reducing sedentary time, really focusing on that, just as Dr. Professor Gill had said, are also important, especially for inactive adults. So now segueing into some then think, areas that we're looking at with doing better with dietary assessment. And this is uh, this section is called temporal dietary patterns. So the, there may indeed be associations of diet to time, amount of food consumed, dietary quality. Barriers to researching this relationship of time to diet has been limitations in the methods that we use. And just an aside here, so this particular image, the way this was constructed were we took images from two studies and all we did was said, can we find food being consumed every hour of a 24-hour day? And we were able to find, actually it was quite easy, to find that individuals eat throughout the whole day. I mean, throughout the whole 24-hour day. And so, and so this was from one, that one study was done in the United States and the other study was done in Australia. So this also represents that this is a worldwide observation. So in order to explore the um, temporal dietary patterns, this is a study that was done by uh, the group I work with. And so we wanted to determine the relationship of energy consumption, time, and diet quality over a 24-hour period. The reason we need the 24-hour period is this is what is gathered in NHANES. So this is based on NHANES data. And so the challenge is, what is the feature vector for quantifying time? Because time is not, a, it's not linear. It's, so time is proportional and it is not linear and it doesn't conform to any of our um, methods that we're using mean. So in order to examine this, we looked at proportional amounts consumed and we used as our indicator the Diet Quality Index, the 2005 Healthy Eating Index, and to see if over different time patterns vary by diet quality. This is what we used in order to complete this. It's, di it's called dynamic time warping. And what dynamic time working is used for speech recognition. So just as I am holding my words longer and holding them shorter, and Professor Gill held his words longer and shorter, and we both did them differently, that's a complex recognition problem, but we have solved that with being able to do speech recognition. So we took that same methodology and applied it to time of day with regard to eating. 
So I can't go through all these um, formulas here. I, I did this by working with individuals who do understand these type of formulas. <laughs> so this graph shows the clusters of that we use kernel k means and once we define these various groups we use we use um, clustering and these graphs here show the time of the largest eating event so among the sample of n means they, we were able to this if this clustering worked the best we went from all the way from two clusters to eight clusters but this one had the uh, equivalent numbers in each group, and then these had the largest significant differences between them. And this represents, again, this is the time of the largest eating event in the day. And so you can see how it varies by some, their largest eating events, that red line goes across, they're, they're sort of peak at the same time, but the others have distinct time. So this, this one shows the second largest eating event, the peaks of the second largest eating event of the day. Now, the, in this case, uh, we also, with this particular study here, we looked at race, ethnicity, survey years, poverty income, and racial differences. And with regard to temporal dietary patterns, race, ethnicity, poverty, income, and age were the only ones that had uh, made a difference with regard to the results. Now, if you look up at the top corner, you'll see that if you try to follow, this is kind of a little computogram almost, but you'll see there's one group that has a square that marks <coughs> their, this is their second highest eating occasion, another group that has diamonds, another group that has um, also, with diamonds are larger and the diamonds are smaller, and then another group that has a pyramid. So if you examine those a bit, you might in your mind think which group had the highest diet quality. So if you guessed it as this, so the C1 group, which is this group that has their smaller, large amounts, and they're more equally distributed across the day, had the highest diet quality than any of the other groups that either had high eating occasions at the far end of the day, the middle of the day, or the end of the day. And then I'll point out to you the one group. So this lowest group, C4, you can see that the highest meal of the day was that this would be zero, this would be midnight, right here. And they, that was the, this particular group, even though they had other peaks, had the lowest diet quality. So the takeaway here is that temporal dietary pattern does exhibit proportionally similar energy consumption throughout a 24-hour day. Those individuals had the best quality diet in this particular sample of NPs. And temporal dietary patterns can be used to identify differences in diet quality and enhance understanding of the complicated interplay of time and dietary intake. And use of pattern recognition techniques were found to be useful for identifying dietary patterns. So now going into how that was showed how we can tap into dietary information, but now how can we better capture dietary information? And this one I want to introduce you the idea of using contextual information to improve dietary assessment. And <clears throat> Most of the um, studies that uh, use this, they use this as a result of capturing images. So using image as your primary capture. Now this isn't that you can also collect contextual information when you use, use traditional methods, either the 24-hour dietary recall or a dietary record. It's just that with images, there, it, it, some of these are easier to capture. So contextual information refers to any information that is not directly produced by the visual appearance of an object in the scene. So that's with using images. But you can also think it of it as it isn't something that comes up from looking at the food. So types of context is, and this first one is food co-occurrence. So this can, you can help identify foods by knowing food co-occurrence. Temporal information gives you information. Geolocation and accelerometer. Outdoor or indoor will make a difference. Temperature, weather conditions, and then the user input themselves. 
So to walk you through how food cool currents can make a difference for ton of day, and I'll, I will walk you through this. This image is stylized in order to show you the concept of using contextual information to automatically identify food. And when I say automatically, I mean a back end classifier working with these working with these algorithms to identify the images in food. So here's the stylized images that's made in order to make this concept more understandable. First, segmentation. And that you can see there are now lines around these, and that is done automatically. Now here is then identify the food. So if you can see then these have now been identified with blue labels. So this is identified as a Coke. This item here is identified as chicken. Now those of you might, some of you close might be able to recognize that's not chicken, but that's kind of the point of going through this uh, exercise. And then this is identified as a sandwich, and this is identified as pepper sauce. Now using contextual information then, if we use the contextual information of time, this particular person, temporal gathered, the classifier knows the person does not usually eat chicken in the morning. Thus, the food label is modified to fries. So, whoops. So that, so that becomes fries now. Going from here to here, using food co-occurrence, if it's fries, the classifier would know, well, usually pepper sauce isn't done with fries, so this will now become ketchup. And then, the next step is using a personalized learning model, which has been informed by the person, the way they drink. They only drink Diet Coke, so now this Coke has been labeled to Diet Coke. And actually, this sandwich has been labeled to Fish Sandwich, because of knowing that this person usually selects fish sandwich. So oftentimes people say, how can you see the inside of things? You can't see the inside of things with automatic recognition, but you can use, start to develop personalized learning models that will allow you to know those things that sometimes you cannot see. So food co-occurrence pattern, another one would be peanut butter with bagels. Now for some people that might be kind of, that doesn't make sense, but there are some people that eat peanut butter with bagels or eating sausage with pancakes. And food occurrence patterns can be explored the same way we explore other relationships such as this heat map, which helps inform food co-occurrence patterns. And this personalized learning model then is the idea of following an individual and in time you can get to identify uh, repeated food co-occurrence patterns, temporal information as to when certain foods are eaten, and other can all be put into this model for helping to identify food. Geolocation is, um, is actually an excellent method, especially with the amount that people are dining away from home, um, then you can use information from where they are dining. This here shows an actual program that identifies geolocation and then it maps the location to the menu items from nearby restaurants. And then it uses that information in order to identify in the image what the food is that was um, ordered. So the takeaway here is that people often not realize how their surrounding factors influence their food choices and amount that we consume. This, this is an important behavioral concept that we use in counseling, but it's also an important concept with automatically identifying food. And contextual information can improve food recognition accuracy using computer vision techniques. So now though, what I'm gonna go into is, if we use images, how are the different approaches to using images? What, where, what, what can one use? And so there are different approaches, and this is kind of a broad stroke about the different approaches. But the biggest divisions are passive collection or active collection. So passive is a wearable camera or some device. These collect lots of data. A lot of data is collected. Users, if it's automated, do not need to be engaged. It should just go on its own. And it, it, you need to be able to detect the eating events after the images are collected. And the images can be used for other things because you're collecting all, all sorts of information throughout the day. And indeed, you might, someone might have one, one right now and collecting what's going on in this room. And then, but so that means there are also privacy issues. 
And then active capture is using something such as a mobile telephone. These are focused images. They've been taken specifically to capture the food. And users do need to be engaged, and, and, but it also provides contextual information and it has better quality images. So to put this into perspective, I'll show you how these might occur. Passive approach would collect approximately one image every five seconds. That translates to 400,000 images per day, and most are not related to food. The active approach, six to 12 images per day. And those are likely before and after images, where indeed the passive approach would have gotten the before, 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 as well as the after, after, after. This is what a passive approach looks like. These are images that time has elapsed over 24 minutes. This is the active approach. Time elapsed 24 hours. And so this shows the before images here. And then what I didn't show, what I don't have on here, is there would be companion after images. But you can see the difference in the quality of the images, which, which plays a role in image identification. So one EV patient passes. This is 35 images from approximately 180 images over a 15-minute eating occasion. Then those images can be compiled in order to identify the activity, the, what comprises the meal. Yet on the other one, this is an active image before and after. So all of these methods of being able to combine mobile phone, um, passive data collection, have been outlined in a paper that's in the um, Proceedings of Nutrition Science. And you can see that it's a lot of trees, a lot of trees. There's a lot of paths that can be taken with technology now and being able to collect diet of combining active capture, passive capture, as well as writing. The idea is eventually for us to be able to actually measure the total, have a more composite measure of dietary pattern, dynamism, geolocation, physical activity, and put that together to define various exposures that people experience throughout the day. And so I want to thank my colleagues and, um, and also Rick Traiano for not being able to come so I could come to this meeting. <laughs> thank you very much.